Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Shane Cle Commons. I'm a professor of law in the School of Law at the University of Limerick. And I'm delighted to invite uh, Maeve Lewis, uh, an alumni uh, of the University of Limerick, to speak to me today about victims of crime. Uh, Maeve and I work together on the Victims' Rights Alliance. Uh, she's been a fantastically impressive individual and has been at the forefront of many of the changes that have been occurring in our criminal process over the last number of years. She's the CEO of One in Four. She's also um, an expert on uh, uh, sexual trauma, trauma and has given evidence before the International Criminal Court. And she also provides training on sexual trauma, trauma to prosecutors and investigators. Um, so I'm really looking forward over the next few minutes to, to speaking with Maeve um, about her experiences at the coal, coal face of advocating for, for uh, victims' rights um, in the Irish criminal process. So Maeve, you're very welcome, and I really appreciate you taking the time to, to actually uh, speak with us today. Well, thank you, Shane. I know it's a great honour um, to be speaking during Alumni Week. Um, I remember with great fondness my time in Limerick. In fact, in those days, it was NIHE. It became UL a couple of years after I graduated, but it was... Um, a hugely formative part of uh, my life. I did a degree in European studies at the time. And, um, you know, certainly the breadth and depth of the work we did during that degree course has been a, a source of um, huge support to me um, as I went on uh, through my career. Maeve, I recall about a year ago, you and I were on a radio program and we were discussing anonymity uh, anonymity for for victims and complainants and one of the things that really struck me as you as you spoke was your 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 thoughtfulness and your consideration of all of the issues and the that to some extent I, I don't like using the word balance but how uh, you know justice as accommodation how, how to ensure that uh, the needs and concerns of all were met but but in particular that uh, a proper a place was was our, our proper status was given to, to 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 victims and complainants. And I suppose my question for you to begin with, Maeve, is how have you become so interested in the whole area of victims' experiences and um, you, you know the, the 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 experiences in particular of victims in the Irish criminal process? Well, years ago when I left UL, I um, did a HDP ed in Trinity and became a teacher. Uh, but during those years, I was a volunteer in the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre, a volunteer counsellor, and I just became hugely interested in the whole area of sexual violence. Um, I suppose back in those days, I mean, it was a very, very dark period, uh, particularly in, in relation to the statutory arrangements for victims of sexual crime in this country. And we have made huge strides uh, since then. I was um, offered a job as an education officer in the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre, which I, I took and then went and trained as a psychotherapist. I went and did a psychology degree in UCD and postgrad training in psychotherapy. So I just became immersed really in the whole world of sexual trauma. And while on the one hand, that is a very personal trauma, um, it's a very personal journey for the survivor in the privacy of the therapy room. The survivor often also has to engage with the statutory systems that are out there, obviously the criminal justice system, but very often to the child protection system. So, for example, in one in four, all our clients are men and women who've been sexually abused in childhood. And often there are huge child protection concerns because the person who abused them is still out there and maybe abusing the next generation of children. But um, in particular, I suppose the criminal justice system is the arena where a lot of the power and the uh, authority uh, that is core to uh, the abuse of power and authority that's core to the experience of sexual trauma is actually played out in a way that is often really re-traumatizing uh, to the complainant witness. And we have had many, many clients who would say, look, that experience was actually worse than the original experience of abuse. It's, it's, it's damaged me even more. So from that point of view, um, we have invested a huge amount of energy at one in four in, in trying to influence and challenge and campaign to actually change the experience of the victim in the criminal justice system. So I don't know if that sort of gives a... No, mate, that uh, is 
perfectly captures uh, the question that I asked. And actually, just as a an aside, one of the things that struck me as you as you spoke there was that you know for a very long period of time that the model of justice as we understood it was it, the state versus the accused, and they were really the only stakeholders that were important um, in terms of, of of the of the conflict. And did you find that frustrating? That, for example, that um, that 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 they were the assumptions and they were the commitments that that drove the system. And I suppose even as part of that, as you talk about, you, you talk about the, the the personal journeys of of survivors. But again, when we look at that state accused model, that you know it, it it encompassed criminology, which was knowledge about the journeys of and the lives of offenders. Um, but it didn't seem to encompass uh, or incorporate the narratives or the lives or the stories of victims. And did, did you find that difficult? Absolutely. I mean, maybe for people listening to this who don't who watch maybe, um, you know, American crime drama, courtroom dramas in the Irish criminal justice system. If I am a victim of a sexual assault or a rape um, or of child sexual abuse, I am a complainant witness. I am only a witness, as one of our clients said to us lately, I am only a witness. I have no more rights than any other witness who might be in that system. Well, that's not totally true, but almost true. Whereas, as you well know, Shane, under Irish constitutional law, there, and, and indeed under case law in the, the Supreme Court, there are huge protections for the rights of the accused person, the right to a good name, the right to a fair trial, and so on. And of course, that is absolutely right. And if any of us were to be accused of a very heinous crime, we would want our rights uh, to be protected and, and, and the right to a fair trial. But over the years, that, uh, uh, I suppose, culminated in witness, the witness, the person who had been raped or sexually abused, having absolutely no rights in the court, not even the right, for example, to have a support person in the courtroom with him or with her, except at the discretion of the judge. And back in the old days, we certainly had experiences where we were kicked out of court um, as you know, not having the right to be there. Um, now, th there has been a huge amount of change over the years, but partly as the result of work of people like One in Four, the Rape Crisis Network, and so on and so forth. And indeed, we're at a very exciting time, I think, in the Irish criminal justice system, where because of a number of things, one, there is a, an EU directive on victims' rights, uh, which has been transposed into Irish law. Number two, the Belfast rape trial, which absolutely horrified, I think, everybody living on this island and indeed internationally, which really brought to the forefront the appalling experience somebody who brings a complaint can have in a court. Now, I mean, it is in a different jurisdiction and there were some slightly different factors there, but that has led to um, a review of the experience of victims of sexual crime in the Irish criminal justice system. And I have never seen the Department of Justice move so quickly uh, and indeed with the support of Minister for Justice Helen McEntee who really seems to get the issues um, to begin to bring in uh, changes in the law of course but changes in the entire process that will make the experience of being in court more um, less traumatizing actually is the word for the victim so there are an awful lot of changes um, both at present but also going forward that are going to be introduced, which should help reduce the um, the ordeal, is the only word I can use for it, of actually being in a criminal trial. The other thing we have to remember is the cases that get to trial, they are the tip of the iceberg, you know, like we estimate that probably about 5% of child sex offenders are actually ever prosecuted in the courts. And then, of course, the um, attrition rate is, is also quite high. Um, so that raises all sorts of questions as well. Um, so, I mean, very simple things like the ability to give evidence by video rather than having to sit in the court and look at the person who abused you or raped you. Um, the use of screens, perhaps, um, so that you're not staring into the face uh, to make sure that every single courthouse in this country has a separate victim suite where somebody can sit waiting to be called as a witness, have a cup of coffee and not be running into the person who abused you or perhaps their family in as you sit on a bench in a corridor outside the courtroom. Um, the right to have a support person with you, which is actually now coming into effect. Um, the, the right 
to have a pretrial hearing, which will deal with all the issues like what is admissible evidence? Can your counselling notes be admitted? Um, all the various legal issues. So that they're all sorted before the trial starts because delay is another absolutely huge factor in the Irish criminal justice system. And very often we go down to court with clients, uh, some legal issue comes up and the trial is postponed and maybe for another three months or nine months or another year. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I, I feel like I'm rabbiting on now, Shane. There are just no, so no, many no, issues there. And, and I, I, I really find all of this fascinating, actually. And the first question that came to my mind when you spoke about the Belfast rape trial is that um, that may have been an anchoring point uh, for public outrage. But of course, you would have known about this phenomenon, uh, this, it, it's age old, it, it, and I don't think I'm being dramatic in saying that, that this has been with us for a very long period of time. It's been with us since we've had a modern criminal process that th this, this issue of trauma in the courtroom. Um, and uh, so would you agree with that, that, it's, that it, it may have appeared? In the I would. I mean, the, the only difference in the North Belfast trial is in Northern Ireland, the um, alleged offender is allowed to be named before they're convicted whereas they're not down here. But listen, we had a situation here, I'm not sure, is it 18 months ago or so, where a barrister, a female barrister actually, was waving round a thong, which the woman who'd been raped had been using, or wearing, excuse me, when she was raped, by a stranger, when she was on her way home from a night out with her friends, with the purpose of really undermining the credibility of that woman to suggest that she was out trying to entice men because her underwear was quite sexy. I mean, that is the sort of thing that still happens in court here, and it's utterly shocking that it should. Uh, on that, uh, Maeve, and actually, you know, even from teaching evidence law, one of the things that struck me is that whilst uh, there was a lot of flexibility given in respect of a defence, that uh, there was very little scrutiny of questions, let's say, that were asked of, of prosecution witnesses. And so, for example, the, the first issue that comes to mind there is the one that you have actually just touched upon, which is the issue of relevance. I mean, how, how could that possibly have any probative value? And yet, uh, you know, if it was in reverse, that would be challenged and uh, 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 ruled out and the question wouldn't have had to be answered. Whereas when it's when it's focused on a, a, a prosecution witness, in this case, the, the, the complainant, uh, it, it, it seems that it doesn't come under such scrutiny and such questions are allowed. Um, so I completely um, understand the point that you're making there. I also, I was going to ask you, Maeve, about um, the, the challenges, and we have come a long way. I think that's fair to say. And actually, I think you're being very modest, Maeve, because I think it's the work that organizations such as yours and the women's movement and so on, a lot of this grassroots phenomenon about highlighting the issues, and those issues could be, as you pointed out, delay, uh, attrition rates, under-reporting, and then the experiences in, 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 in court all of those have had to, um, you know, be pushed from the bottom up, as it were, so that people could actually see. Um, and then also even, you know, what you talked about there, that that contest shape of the trial itself and how, how, how bruising and how, how difficult that can be um, for a, a, a complainant. So everything you spoke about there in terms of challenges, um, it, it was great to actually to, to consider it. In... As we, if we're going forward, and you know, in, in terms of uh, predicting the future, I, I, I believe me, even, but I'm an optimist. I think that if the last 150 years was about the state versus accused model of justice, and uh, you know, rights for the accused party, and a, a really strong understanding of of the offender, and so on, and putting in place individualized uh, sentencing approaches, I think the next hundred years will be much more about the accommodation of victims into the criminal process. That has to happen. It should have happened much sooner, but it's it's it has gathered momentum now. But I think that that, that momentum will continue into the future and it will be constantly about, you, you know, looking to improve protections for complainants and, and victims, but also, I think, um, you know, information rights and also participation rights. Would you agree with that, Maeve? Do you think that, are you, would you be as oh. optimistic... Yeah, I am quite optimistic. As I said, I've never seen such activity in the Department of Justice as has been in the last say, year. Um, changes are coming, like things like pre-trial hearings, things like the right, as I mentioned, to have an advocacy support person in court with you. Um, we have a, we have a lot to learn. Um, there, there, are, there are other things going forward. Um, 
For example, there's been changes to the admission of counselling notes um, in that they now can be scrutinised by the judge for relevance. But there is also a lot of things we could do. For example, in the UK, um, in first of all, all the barristers involved uh, in the trial of sexual offences have to have training in uh, sexual trauma, which would perhaps give people pauses to the sort of questions they might ask. Uh, barristers have to submit their line of questioning to the trial judge for approval before the trial, which would preclude the appalling situation I just described there. Um, the, there's been a new report in Scotland, which actually is, is, is one of the model countries now when it comes to the way we deal with sexual crime, um, which have some very challenging, perhaps, proposals. Number one, should we have juries in trials of sexual offences? because juries can come into court with all the old rape myths in their heads. And again, constitutionally, judges are, uh, well, shall we say, the, 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 only to a level can they address that, for example, in their, in their summing up or whatever, that all legal professionals, including the judges, must have training in sexual trauma, that there would be special, and that there would be specialist courts in relation to sexual trauma, just as in a sense we have here now, to some extent with, um, with uh, uh, domestic violence. I can still see awful problems though. Um, you know, for example, all of us working in the field have been very concerned about counseling notes, but some protections are now going in for that. What is going to be a huge problem is the admission of um, social media communications by the complainant witness to her friends or to the person who abused them or whatever. And that became an issue in the uh, the trial in Belfast, um, and it is increasingly a problem in the UK, where the police have to, you know, wade through hundreds and thousands of emails and WhatsApp messages and whatever, you know, and photos and, and so on and so forth. So that's going to be a huge problem, um, you, you know, and I don't think people are aware actually of how, the, how that material could be used. It can also, will also lead to enormous, even greater delays here. Um, so that would be a major issue. And you mentioned anonymity shame, but while the traditional print media and electronic media are very circumscribed in what they can print and what they can say. Um, so, for example, a complainant witness, even after conviction, must never be identified without their permission, um, whereas the, the alleged offender on conviction can be identified. Um, but we know, and it was a complete feature of the Belfast rape trial, that everybody in Northern Ireland knew who that young woman was because everybody was texting and you know, meeting from the court, including some of the jurors, I understand. And how can we prevent that happening, happening here? And fear of public reaction is one of the big factors that, um, that, that really dissuade people from coming forward and making a complaint to the court. And we're a very small country, Shane. So, like I'm from Lena in County Prairie, if I'm raped, do I really want the whole town to know what's happened to me? Um, and that may well be a factor that would make me say, actually, I'm not going further with this, do you know? Yeah, it's a very good point. Uh, Maeve, I have one final question for you. And it's actually, it's, I mean, obviously crime is a, is a broader issue than simply the courtroom. And, you know, it's a societal issue. And uh, you have spoken and, and are engaged so much in training. Um, and I wonder do, and this is peculiar now to universities, but do universities, can, can they play a greater role in, in education on, uh, on, on, on sexual trauma and so on, and, and, and the process that should be put in place in, um, in higher education institutions, for example, and awareness raising? Do, do you think that universities have a role to play in that regard? Of, co of course they do, of course they do, Shane. Like so many of your students will go on to train as solicitors and barristers, um, so all the universities, all the, you know, the law society, the bar society and all their training courses, sexual trauma should be a huge, huge part of, uh, of that training. Like trauma informed processes has become the buzzword now in the criminal justice system. Everybody's talking about it, the guards, the DPP's office, um, barristers, Department of Justice, everybody's talking about it. But I'm not sure they understand what it actually means, and especially when it comes to to sexual trauma um, like when I do training over in the International Criminal Court with the prosecutors and barristers one exercise I get them to do is turn to the person next to you and tell them 
about a really good sexual experience you've had, well, I can tell you the room stops horror. Whatever. Now, I never intend to do that. If I'm training psychotherapists, I do, but it wouldn't be appropriate in that context. But it just gives them the tiniest inkling yeah. of what it's like to stand up in a room full of strangers yeah. and be cross-examined in quite an aggressive and assertive way about what was the worst probably moment in your life and the worst sexual experience that you've ever had and to go through that in minute detail. So, you know, we still have a long way to go, but I am optimistic. I mean, I've been working in this field now for God, 25 years. And I mean, there have been so many positive changes and you can see it with our legislators. You can see it in our policymakers. You can see it. Gordy, for example, have made enormous strides in how they deal with sexual uh, victims of sexual crime. And if a big, huge match organization like that can do it, well, then I don't see why the court system can't. But as you say, our criminal justice system is situated within a society. And if there are still people out there, which they, they, are, they are, who carry all the old myths about sexual violence, sexual abuse and so on. Um, you know, I'm, you know, I was one of the feminists in the 90s marching up and down O'Connell Street and we thought everything would change. But as the At Me Too movement has shown, actually, a lot hasn't changed. And a lot of that is the more subtle um, uh, acceptance in society and the difficulties young women now still have and young men in coming forward. And, you know, the, the, great, um, the great American psychiatrist, Judith Herman, who's written extensively on trauma, you know, she says that if, uh, that at the core of sexual trauma is the desire to deny what has happened and at the same time, the desire to proclaim it, that works at an individual level. So, for example, in the therapy room, that's where we begin to unpack in privacy and confidentially what has happened. But it also has to happen at societal level if the societal healing that has happened because of sexual violence and domestic violence um, is ever to be opened up, explored and really, really addressed. You know, and um, I'm optimistic we can do that, but uh, we're not there yet. You know. Well. I, all I can say to you, um, Maeve, is that, you know, like we're very proud of the fact that you're a University of Limerick graduate. And on a personal level, um, you know, it's been a, a real privilege for me to actually do this interview with, with you. Um, I, I've witnessed firsthand your work. I, 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 I see what you do in the Victims' Rights Alliance, but I also see how you, how you work with others. And for example, um, and you'll know this, we, we're currently doing a human rights and policing module with Angari Shiokona, but they also wanted to reach out to you, such as your name in the field. You've done phenomenal work um, over the past 25 years, um, and, and I'm glad that the University of Limerick could recognise it in this small way, and it's been a pleasure to, to do this interview with you today. I hope we can continue to collaborate with the University of Limerick, who have such a strong reputation um, in, in the School of Law, in the research you've been doing in this field, Shane, with your colleagues. So um, it's been a real pleasure to do this. Thank you.